Hello, and welcome to Man's Model Moments. How about that a countdown and everything? This is almost professional. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, Sunday evening, uh, at least in the UK, where I am. Uh, it's probably some other time in the world for you. Uh, hi, John. Uh, I know it's a different time in the world for you, for example. And uh, yes, I did indeed mean seven o'clock this evening, just now, rather than seven o'clock in the morning, which <laughs> would have been too early for me as well. So uh, thank you, John Alec, for pointing that schoolboy error out. Um, see, we all make mistakes, you know. So, uh, so thanks for joining. Um, I'm sure people will will come in as we come. Hello, hobby time. Uh, it usually takes a few minutes for everybody to get in. So tonight is the second live build session for the FX 148 scale Hawker Hunter. And at the end of last session, we had left the aircraft in various stages of subassembly, all ready for us to do some painting, for me to do some painting. Now, I've just come out to get prepped for this. And one of the things I wanted to do before actually starting the stream is get my compressor on so that the tank is full so I don't have a big noisy compressor going during the stream. And for some reason, it's not working. <laughs> so this uh, might take a little bit of a different turn than I intended. So I might be doing a bit more brush painting than I had expected to do with this build um, because certainly I didn't expect to uh, brush paint the whole thing. Um, and certainly it won't be brush painting the whole thing, but it might be brush painting the cockpit and interior to start with, and then seeing where we go from there. So let me just see one second if this is going to, going to work. Now, if you heard that click followed by nothing, that means my compressor is not working. For reasons which I have no idea. It did do this a couple of weeks ago, and I just left it, and suddenly it came back. So I suspect there is something that needs some adjustment. I do have a replacement. In fact, let me just grab that. I do have this replacement. Uh, pressure assembly. So this is the bit basically senses the pressure. It tells the thing to, to switch on or off. So that assembly. I really hope I don't have to replace it. Um, just because it's a bit of a pain in the ass, you know. Uh, but essentially, that's the on off piece. You just heard click previously. And of course, there was nothing there, which, you know, of course, there isn't just the mechanical pieces on here. There are also the electrical connections to make, I guess. So, yeah, not particularly looking forward to that if I have to do that. Model building of a sort that I don't really intend and don't really want to have to do. But if I have to, I have to. It has... Uh, it has served me faithfully this compressor for quite a long time. Um, so we'll see. Anywho, let's uh, have a look at where we got to with the kit. Oh, you can see I am branded tonight. <laughs> it's difficult to tell <laughs> when you're on cam. All right. Look, I fully intended to have the... There is a little bit of air still in the tank, but certainly not enough, I don't think, to warrant it not turning on. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's the reason. We just haven't hit the pressure bottom out. If I do go down that route and actually try using the airbrush and it does kick in, it's pretty loud. So I'll probably mute the stream at that point, wait till it actually kicks back off and then carry on. Hi, Richard. Oh, now, the thing is, where did I put the kit? Now it's here. So, 
these of course the little pieces <laughs> wings these are large pieces cockpit no that's not the cockpit that's the tail there's the cockpit And then all the other sprues that we don't need right this second. Which I can put over there. So, question is do we do some brush painting or do we risk the airbrush? I am inclined to risk the airbrush for the cockpit at least. For these pieces, the internal bits here don't mind going to brush painting because they are not very visible they'll be weathered so yeah i think that'll be okay for these intakes of course i can't really brush paint <laughs> down this serpentine air intake i really do need to blast air into there so that will certainly have to wait you see sometimes you make these plans and then you find that your plans are all scuppered by real life crashing in with some inconvenient thing. But as I test fitted at uh, the last build, now that these are dry, see, I put those together, they're absolutely seamless. There's no issue with the bit there. And then putting this on, again, no problem. I haven't trimmed off the tab, that's why it's not going down. But that all fits in quite nicely. I do like the way this is engineered. So that's all looking good. In fact, let's just trim that little piece off there. First of all, can't forget the nerd glasses. Um, if any of you do have, well, let's face it, it's an inevitable um, part of the human condition that as we get older, um, it, this is just biology. Your uh, your eyes become less flexible. The uh, it's that's why it's hard to focus close up. Is because you're you're actually stiffening up, um, not only in other parts of your body but your eyes as well. So they're less able to focus on near things. I find these are absolutely invaluable because you can wear them like glasses. Um, they provide pretty good magnification there's a whole range of these and they're pretty lightweight um these are the rechargeable versions so it has a little light in here it's three levels of uh, two levels of brightness i think and they're usb-c rechargeable i've just got them on this little magnetic thing so i don't have to unplug them plug them all the time uh, it saves the the internal jack but i find these are really good and they're, they're not very expensive um so I would recommend these. These are pretty good. But also, I just use normal reading glasses sometimes if I'm just doing some, you know, not particularly delicate work. I just need a bit of a better view on something. Um, but these, it's like going back 10 years to where my eyes would uh, focus any distance. So I used to have a set of Rolson equivalents, which were a bit medieval by comparison. Um, and again, a lot of it is the advances in battery technology for the lights. You don't have to have the lights. You know, you can use the battery version, um, so the non-rechargeable version, the, the like disposable battery version, and then just not put the batteries in, which makes it lighter still. Let's just test fit that piece now. It's uh... wow. Okay, that's quite impressive. So just push fit. I don't even try to to fit that down. That's basically holding the thing together. That's you know I'm really impressed with the level of uh, Airfix's CAD design, the engineering. You know the, the transfer of the design, the three D design to the actual molds. It's really impressive. And it looks like we have these little tabs. Ah. 
if you remember last time, I had a little bit of an issue trying to locate these front tabs, but it seems you've got those little bits in the wing there. Kind of aids. I say that and then I can't get the little locating pins in. Probably because I can't see what I'm doing. Ah, there we go. Okay. So that all kind of makes it a lot more structurally sound. There's a little bit of a gap, a little bit of a step there, but I think, again, with a bit of... I'm just basically getting all the, these fuselage halves aren't even glued together. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of work to do here, but overall, the fit of that is not bad at all. Very nice. See what it looks like when it's got some cement on it, but... That looks pretty good. Can't tell I'm stalling <laughs> before I get onto these this painting thing. Now, first thing I always do with painting smaller pieces like this is I'll put them on these little little clips. So you can buy these on Amazon. Um, I'd appreciate it if you are going to buy them. If you go through my Amazon affiliates link, you can take out a small, <laughs> a very small kickback from them. Um, it doesn't cost you anything more. Um, but these are really handy for holding parts like this. And what I do, the, there is a version at Amazon that comes with like a little block base. I think I've mentioned this before, like a little plastic base with little holes drilled in. I didn't buy that because you can buy more of these without them. And then I should really turn off Discord notifications. You know when I'm doing this. Um, and then find your own solution. So there's a couple of things that I I do for this. So the kind of uh, not expanded polystyrene, but um, the other sort of spongy uh, foam that you sometimes get in like TV packaging and stuff. Um, I'll stab it into that if I've got a section of that. Um, so if I need to do that, you know, as a, as a push, I'll do that. However, what I use most of the time is basically a piece of aluminium extrusion uh, with a wood cover that then has holes drilled in it. Now, having said that, trying to find it after clearing everything up the other day, when I was limited on time. Ah, here we go. I did say it was almost professional when I got my countdown, didn't I? This is the non-professional bit. Um, unfortunately, I dropped it and this piece came up. I need to stick it back on. But but actually, it's quite useful for, for this. It's almost as though I did this on purpose. I didn't, but it's almost as though I did. This is just a regular piece of... Uh, 20 mil aluminium extrusion you can buy it basically anywhere it's pretty cheap it's uh, very strong so i actually have my lighting rig and my camera rig made of this i, I made that all myself i actually did a video on it um so it's nice and light but it's heavy enough it's light you know in terms of moving it around but it's heavy compared to styrene so that gives enough you know, weight to keep things nice and, and secure. And basically, this uh, this is actually part. This is a slat from a cupboard door. Um, when we ripped out the bathroom, they had these slatted doors, which are a bit nineteen eighties. And um, I thought I could I could make a use for those, so I took them apart, used all the slats. Um, so I got tons of these. That's another example. So here is an example. This is one that I've used for spraying um, like 28 millimeter D and D minis, that kind of thing. So this is just double sided 3M tape, and uh, then you can just stick your minis on or parts on. 
and then use them for, for priming. So that's one thing I've done with them. And then this is another. So I'm always looking for, well, not necessarily looking for, but I always look at things with an eye of, you know, how might I be able to use that? And this is one of them. So this, this aluminium channel, all I've done is, again, this is, this is single-sided foam tape. So this has just been put into, so the adhesive side is down. So it's been pressed into this channel. So that forms a nice spongy layer at the bottom. This is a super glued on top, which is why this one's come up when I dropped it. It's just you know, super glue isn't very springy, so it's quite brittle. Um, you could probably use five minute epoxy if you want a better bond. Um, this I just cobbled up in like five minutes. So, and I've just drilled holes, you know, every however often. These are about what about uh, inch and a half, inch and three quarters, about five centimeters, um, four or five centimeters maybe apart. I say I haven't measured them. I just did it by eye. Uh, these go in quite nicely, and um, because you've got the, the foam there at the bottom, they kind of stay in place, don't wiggle around too much, but you have got a bit of flexibility. And you can put a whole bunch of these, and pretty big part, and because you've got the weight of the aluminium at the bottom, the channel, the whole thing doesn't move. So I usually take them out, spray, and then put them back in here just to rest. So if you don't have the foam, they tend to rock about in here. They don't stay where you put them. So the advantage of the foam is it just secures them in the bottom. So it's like you've got two-point anchoring a little bit. And you can do it with basically any size, for instance. So I find this as a really, you know, homemade solutions um, to a lot of the problems in modeling. You don't need to spend lots of money in modeling. We can. We do. You know, sometimes it's quite therapeutic and quite nice to do that. But it's not a requirement by any stretch of the imagination. You know, it's quite easy to use these kind of uh, slightly Heath Robinson solution to problems. It's what people have always done. And there's no reason that we you know, can't continue doing that sort of thing in the 21st century. So. OK, so there's all my small parts kind of prepped. I don't need these. And if you've got larger parts, of course, or you just want to make sure nothing touches each other, you can just space these out. You know, there's nothing to, to stop you doing that. But it just allows things to dry without you having to touch them, without having to put them down somewhere. Um, keeps them nice and out of the way. And it stops you losing them as well. You know, I find one of the big things with small parts is often where have I put them? You know, it, it's often fine to actually get all these pieces, especially if you're cutting a lot of pieces off before assembling. So this is one nice solution to doing that. Uh, the other one I have is using little containers, same ones that I use for making model pigments. These little ones, these are great for all kinds of stuff. And again, you can buy these off Amazon or you know other places, I'm sure, in the US, you know, Walmart or Hobby Lobby or something or wherever will sell these. They're literally pennies or less, you know, each by like a hundred or whatever. And small parts. So if I'm then working on a kit, say I have to stop it for any reason. So particularly with the channel, you know, sometimes I'll be doing something, I have to pause it, do something else. I've got another commitment or I want to get a video out for a certain time. Storing all your little bits in here rather than just putting them back in the box stops them one from getting lost and secondly from getting damaged you know um if you want you can put a little bit of uh, tissue in there as well just to cushion them if they're especially delicate i don't really i don't think i've ever done that because i don't think i've ever had anything that delicate photo etch parts as well you know it's good for containing those if you want to just separate parts out for assemblies you know in the future all that kind of good stuff just little solutions like this i think you know are the kinds of things that that we can share in the community. It doesn't cost us anything. It's not proprietary. It's just little tips and stuff. I've learned loads of things from other modelers and you know anything that I can pass on which is useful for other people, uh, I'm happy to do. I think that's in the spirit of the hobby. 
Uh, but you can also buy them through my Amazon affiliates. <laughs> so I can get my 2% or whatever it is. Um, anywho. Uh, Richard, you've got the battery version of the sexy goggles. How do you find them? And is, is that the replaceable battery or the, like, you know, come on guard and buy them from the, the store battery? As I say, mine are the rechargeable battery one. Some people say they have an issue with the weight, but I find, I mean, I will forget that I'm wearing these. So sometimes uh, I'll be working on something out here in my, you know, little man cave. I've done what I want to do, finish for the evening. I want to go in, spend some time with Maria, um, you know, watch some trash TV or whatever. Uh, and I'll go in and I'm still wearing them because they have this um, this little bit here. This is the other thing I like about them. And again, I'm not on commission for these or anything. Uh, this is the other thing I like about them is that they can just hook up and they stay there. My old Rolsons like hinged from the side. The whole assembly went up because it was so big and heavy. It always used to gradually like slide down. It didn't have these positive like pieces that you can see here. Um, so if you just want need to look at you know the instructions for something, you know if you're doing your nerd stuff through the glasses, I need to look at the instructions. You can just pop those up, um, and then they're out of the way, uh, out of your vision field. And the other thing I find with them, they come with some like rubbery plastic. Uh, Things which slip over these nose guards. I find those are quite uncomfortable. Ah, you use the re replaceable batteries, but use rechargeables in them. That's a good shout. Um, I've got a lot of rechargeable batteries, and I always find they're never charged when I need them. So <laughs> having the USB version means I've got loads of USB ports here, so I can easily charge them. Um, but again, I like the fact that they got a couple of versions to cover everybody's needs. Um, but I replace these straight away. They do supply these little, they're like little air cushion um, versions. I find these much more comfortable. Maybe it's because I've got quite a prominent, hard bridge of my nose. Uh, but I find the other ones are quite, um, they're okay. But if you've been wearing them for a while, then you notice them. Whereas these, as I say, I will forget I'm wearing them and go in and Maria's like, what the hell are you wearing? I'm just like, oh, sorry, I forgot. Got my nerd glasses on. My sexy gogs. So, enough, enough of my stalling. Let's just see. Okay, well, I definitely have air in the tank. Let me just check how much air I've got there. Unfortunately, when I swapped over to this compressor about three years ago, I guess. It's got a different display. Yeah, that's quite low. And it's definitely not coming on. Yeah, so what I'm worried about here is if I start spraying and run out of air, then I won't be able to clean the airbrush which is an issue. So just um, let me make sure that this is all plugged in properly and I've not accidentally done something silly. No, nope. I mean, I've got power to it, but it's the same power as on my monitor. I think it's something I'm just going to have to look at another time. Yeah, I've also got two pairs as well, Richard. Um, I actually use one in the shop. So I've actually got a little setup at the shop so that when I'm there in downtimes, uh, I can do a bit of modeling and still do recording. Um, so I've got you know my camera set up uh, already. So I just have to take my camera with me uh, and I can do all that and again. The less I have to cart around with me, the better. So I've got a pair there and a pair here. Okay. So do I do a little bit of clean up on this beforehand? No, I think we'll leave the clean up to do it all at the same time. I don't think there's any point with this in 
and doing the cleanup separately because we're going to need to do well actually that's a very nice seam well basically seamless but we're going to have to do it at the bottom inevitably i haven't come across a kit yet which is absolutely perfect in all regards it doesn't need any um sort of work on sanding seams and things and again whether that's just because um you know i'm not precise enough or whether it's generally the production of kits I think it's also because as humans um, we're very good at spotting irregularities and things that aren't symmetrical and stuff. The way our brains have evolved um, to spot these things. Um, I find developmental biology fascinating, which is obviously why I, why I studied biology and then uh, biochemistry. Um, but I always find it's amazing how we are instantly drawn to certain things. And we will notice things which are tiny, tiny things. You have to look at a step in a piece of art. So if I just, it's going to be hard to do with this. But say I do that, right? Now, I am in 1080p. Apologies to everybody who attended on Friday. That was still in 720p because in StreamYard, you actually have to tell it, even though you've got the account for 1080p, you have to tell it, oh, yes, I want to use that. Why wouldn't you want to use 1080p. Uh, well, I, I guess it's a, a bandwidth thing, right? But um, perhaps this isn't the best to show you. Let's look at the underneath. Okay, so there, right? I think you'll probably be able to see on camera. There's a little bit of a step there, right? Just that seam, right? You can just see the little line of darkness. If I look at that close up with my nerd glasses, that is possibly 0.1 of a millimetre, right? Yeah, especially if we, you know, if I glued that up, primed it, you would spot that straight away because it's a smooth surface and you've got a very regular line with a little step, that little shadow, and your eyes just naturally go to it, which is why, of course, panel lining works because it's creating that artificially to draw your eye so that's why we can see such oh, oh, it's one of the things that we do we notice these you know tiny tiny bits but i don't think so i think it's very hard for a manufacturer to create a kit that has such good tolerances so less than 0.1 millimeter difference between all of its seams for every level of builder right because it only takes a tiny mistake to you know, misalign something by 0.1 of a millimeter Generally, you know, you're not going to get that kind of precision from just these these guidance pieces here, right? There is 0.1 millimeters wiggle room, I'm sure, in all of that. So, again, I think we need to cut kit manufacturers a little bit of slack when it comes to these things. I'm not saying that, you know, huge discrepancies should be forgiven or ignored. But I think sometimes we are a little bit unrealistic with our expectations. I've also noticed an error there. That's actually popped out and then stayed and then cemented into that position. So as I've noticed it, let's deal with that straight away. This is where the effectiveness of liquid cement becomes a problem when you've made a mistake not spotted it and then it's cemented in place okay there we go unfortunately that has then broken that little pipe off bugger Well, these things are sent to try us, as my mother would say. So I'm giving you the, the authentic kit building experience here, complete with, you know, F-ups. 
let's see if I can push that forward pipe out. Yes, OK. Which looks pretty horrible now on the other side. But we'll trim that back. So again, one of the things I, I say to you know newer modelers, young or old, uh, you know whether they're coming to the hobby for the first time or coming back to the hobby, you know, and ask for any advice and stuff. Um, nothing is a dead end in modeling. You know, you can recover from pretty much anything. It's how much time and effort, and how hard it's going to be. That all might change. But never feel that a model is at a point where you can't rescue it if you want to. Now, of course, there are there are some exceptions. Some things are beyond the pale or beyond. <laughs> it's that phrase they use with cars, isn't it? Beyond economic repair. There is a point at which you just think, for my sanity and... Uh, the good of my health I, i'm just going to leave it at this point <laughs> but there we go that's um that's how it should be let's get that glued up before we start oh, God, that's no use. back to my trusty humbrol glue applicator aka humbrol brush I think that happened because I was, I did this, I glued this in, and then I was messing about with this, doing the test fitting and everything, and really forgot about this completely. I might go back and watch my old stream and see exactly how what I did, but right. So then we have to kind of wiggle that round a bit. That's not particularly pretty, but I think now it is there. Once that's all dried, we can trim that because we know what it looks like on the other side. I think it's not too much of an issue. That's kind of the right angle there. Not the disaster it could have been, but if we hadn't have fixed it now, it would have been a much bigger problem. Right? If that fuselage had all got joined up, glued together, and then I'd noticed it, that would have been, again, not irrecoverable, but essentially I'd have had to cut off these pieces and make new ones, which isn't the point with an out-of-the-box build, really. <laughs> They're trying to put the minimum amount in. Okay. Okay, last chance compressor. Come on, third time, third time's charm. Nothing. Damn. Uh, I wonder if it's the water trap. I'll try that later. Okay, I have been forced into doing some paint brushing, which I'm sure will please some people because a lot of people just use airbrushes these days as a default, and uh, you never see paint brushing, you know, old hairy stick brushing. So let's do some of that. Now, I will apply more heresy here. Because you noticed I have not washed this kit. I am not applying primer. I'm going to paint, which I'm sure some of you are reeling in horror at. But uh, as with most things, I find that uh, it depends whether these things are needed. I'm actually doing a video on it. I've been procrastinating about getting outrageous. It's because I've got all the video footage done. I've got to edit it, which is, as any YouTuber watching the stream knows, is always the worst part because you've done all the work, right? And all you've got to do is go over and listen to yourself do the same thing over and over. If I'm doing editing when Maria, my girlfriend, is in the room, um... You know, she'll be on her phone or something and watching pimple popping videos or whatever she looks at. 
And uh, she's just like, oh, my God, how many times do I have to hear the same thing? <laughs> it's just like, and I say to her, yeah, I know. I, I feel the same way. And it's my voice, which is always more annoying, right? When you're listening to your own voice, saying the same things over and over, and you just can't quite get the cut right or can't, can't get the uh, the edit on the, the video at the right place. So, yeah. Okay. So for gunmetal, uh, what I tend to use is Vallejo Oily Steel. Um, I really like this as a colour. It's kind of got a nice... Um, a lot of gunmetals I find are too dark because, again, I've said this many, many times when people talk about um, colours in modelling and they'll talk about, you know, getting the right shade and stuff and, uh, you know, this is paint matched to the, you know, chip of the real aircraft. It's like, well, it's the wrong colour then because that's the right colour if you were painting a one-to-one -one scale. But if you're painting a 148 scale or 172nd scale, you need to, it needs to be much, much lighter. So in general, you need to lighten your colours more and look authentic. And there's also an element of perception. There's also, you know, weathering and sun bleaching stuff. So I think when people say that this is the exact colour of, you know, X, Y, Z, I think they are, let's say, misguided. I don't want to be unkind. Um but I find that most gunmetals do tend to go on that uh, heavy dark side, whereas I find this oily steel is metallic enough to look convincing, um, but it also just has that little darkness to make it look a bit more uh, gunmetally, let's call it. Okay, I do have, because I put it specifically ready for use, palette here somewhere. The question, as always, with these things is, where? <laughs> uh, I've got my old palette that's full of garbage, which I specifically moved away. So normally I mix these on my Vortex mixer. Uh, I'm not doing it because uh, it's on the bench, which my microphone is on, and um, it's quite noisy. So... Uh, I'm trying to avoid that if possible. But generally, I've got this little Vortex mixer. If you don't know what a Vortex mixer is, it's just uh, a little centrifugal device, it's a little device with a motor in it, a little pressure sensor. You push down whatever you're trying to mix on it. And basically, it's got a little rubber thing, so it kind of keeps the base on that motor. And then it basically, you know, spins it around. So you're holding it. The bottom is moving, so effectively it's just doing that, but it's doing it really fast. Um, I tend to put glass balls into my paints, typically when I reconfigure them. So, for instance, here I've got Tamiya XF59, which I've reformatted into this little squeezy bottle. I find these much more convenient. And if I shake it, you can kind of just hear there is little thing in there wiggling around uh, you can see it helps mix the paint much faster especially with tammy which does tend to settle quite quickly because of course it's it's mostly there is more alcohol in tammy paints than there is water i think they're only about 30 percent water and the rest is a mixture of alcohols different types of alcohol so Having a greater percentage of alcohol, okay, alcohol is not very dense. So the density of the pigments compared to the density of the solvent means that they settle out much more quickly. Just think of the Dead Sea, you know, which has a very high density. Things don't sink in it as much. Um, it's really the opposite effect to that. I think you can probably just hear that as well. A little ball cruising around in there. Oh, come on, Alex, where is your palette? It's very, very annoying if it's uh, not here. Bear with me two seconds, folks. Okay, I will use my alternative palette.
Well, I don't know if this is a thing in the US because I know you have very different kind of takeaway containers, but in the UK, this is your standard kind of Chinese takeaway container. Um, I mean, it's not a Chinese takeaway container. It's a takeaway container, but they're often used by Chinese restaurants. Um, Indian restaurants tend to use a slightly different format, but uh, these, whenever I get a takeaway, um, Maria and I decided too lazy to cook. I always put these in the dishwasher and save them. They're great for containing odd bits, you know, whether they be kit parts or spares or, you know, whatever. Um, but at a push, you can also use them as pallets, of course, because um, they're just plastic. And it's a great example of, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. They're easy to clean. You know, there's, there's lots of good things about these. Now, Vallejo paints tend to be quite thick, including for, you know, just uh, paint brushing. It's a little bit too much water, not enough paint. So with paint brushing, I find it, it's one of those strange things about paint brushing, right? Or, or about our communities is that the modeling, the scale modeling community tends to be, uh, let's say, quite exclusive, I would say, in terms of, I don't find a lot of scale modelers also watch, say, miniature painting. What have I done here? Sorry about that. We start that thread of thought again. A lot of miniature painters, uh, sorry, a lot of scale modelers don't seem to be miniature painters or watch miniature painting. Obviously, so that's sliding down again. How annoying. Stay where you are. Thank you. And I think that's quite odd because I think the two communities can learn quite a lot from each other uh, and vice versa, right? You know, so miniature painters tend not to look at scale model channels. And one, I think scale modelers in general are terrible mini painters. Uh, apologies to those of you who aren't, but I'm saying this as a broad generalization. I've seen loads of dioramas which have beautiful AFEs. And then you look at the figures and you think, ooh, that was probably a mistake. <laughs> of course, you don't say that because that would be rude. But, um, you know, miniature painting, figure painting is quite a different set of skills than scale modeling and i think the two benefit from each other if you've ever done miniature painting and you're doing scale modeling i think you're in a better position uh, for some of the activities than if you haven't so i'm just trying to find the relevant pieces here these wells <laughs> And one of the things with any miniature painter will tell you is thinning your paints for brush painting is essential. And you never expect to cover a surface with a single coat. You know, it's a very rare, uh, actually fairly undesirable situation because if you need you need you know thick enough paint to be able to do that you're going to be gunking up a lot of details of course miniature painting you know 28 millimeter 15 millimeter whatever miniatures have tiny tiny details um just like you know the details that we're looking at on instrument panels or whatever even small than that sometimes so it's essential that you know your paint is thin enough not to plug up all of that stuff I'm just looking at the paint references here. I believe all of the wheel wells are gunmetal. Yeah. 56, 56. Yeah. And I think the interior outside of the cockpit area is also. So basically, all of this is going to be gunmetal. 
So if you've thinned your paint and you're using a broad brush, you want the, the broadest brush that makes sense. It does a couple of things. One is you minimize any brush marks. And two, you avoid clogging up any of the detail. Now, if you're doing two or more coats, when this is dry, I'll go in the opposite direction. So perpendicular to the first coat. So again, otherwise, if you're going, it's just like with painting in DIY, right? If you're painting all in the same direction, you risk building up ridges of paint in one direction. Whereas if you alternate your brush strokes, you minimize that. So the same goes for scale painting. I also don't tend to be very careful when I'm brush painting like this. So I will overpaint areas and sides and seams and stuff because I can always scrape that off. If you have to, if you've missed a bit and have to go back, it's always one, it's a pain. Two, you've got to make sure you've matched it. And if you've done any weathering and stuff, that's difficult to or impossible to recreate exactly as you've done. So there are a lot of reasons that I overpaint rather than I'm, I'm not careful about that. You can scrape paint off seams. You know, it's uh, the glue and things. That's not an issue. That's easy to do. You can see the consistency of the paint I've got here is quite, quite liquid. And also, I'm not putting my paintbrush in there straight on. I'll like remove some of the paint first. So it's all about control, right? You want to be able to control what you're doing with the paint. I do find sometimes brush painting is very therapeutic. It's kind of something very nice about just getting your hairy stick out. It sounds quite rude. Um, and uh, lobbing a bit of paint on a model. I also don't really get the hate um, for any painting method, right? For either brush painting or airbrushing you know the whole oh you're not a real modeler if you don't brush paint or you know things can't look good if you're not airbrushing um i think broadly speaking that's bullshit um it's a matter of what you're comfortable with what works for you uh, what you've got time ability skill and money for what effect you're trying to achieve. Um, plus, of course, nobody completely airbrushes a model, right? There'll always be something that you will brush paint, some detail of stuff. So building up your brush painting skills, I think, is an essential part of modeling. Well, either that or you're doing a hell of a lot of masking, <laughs> which I think is a bit weird. <laughs> I think if you're forcing it to the point where you're having to, you know, making yourself airbrush everything, that sounds like kind of a punishment more than a, an enjoyable experience. Uh, which might be your thing. I'm not telling you how to model. It's not why I model. I don't model to punish myself. It's um, For me, it's a rewarding experience. It's you know, relaxing. It's enjoyable. Um Oh, Pablo has a, an opinion there. Okay. So as I'm doing this gunmetal-y piece, let's have a look what else. C61 also needs to be. So let's find where C61 lies. Uh, C61 and 62, that's the ends of the landing gear base. Oh, 
What is it, Pablo? Eh? Oh, I know what it is. Pablo usually has a certain meal at eight o'clock. So I can't say the word because otherwise he'll go insane. But I think you all know which meal I am referring to. It begins with D. I'm sorry, Pablo, you'll have to wait a little bit. So again, if I planned ahead, knowing that my compressor was foobard for the time being, I would have done some of this work last time. Not off camera, because I'm not doing anything off camera on this build. You'll see everything that I do. Okay, interesting. That is halved. I guess to put the wheel in. Hmm. Question is, do I want to start trying to paint all of those gunmetal pieces? Well, I guess we've got the paint out, right? So let's have a little look about what needs to be. And 56 isn't gunmetal, is it? I think it's aluminium. which is fine. Yeah, Aaron, it's a, it's a good point. I think um, most of us started off at some point, either as, you know, kids when we started off in the hobby or, um, you know, through, like I say, through circumstance or preference, whatever, hand painting. Now, those pieces I do not need because they are the wheels up parts. Hmm. I'm in two minds what to do. What do you guys think? Should I go through and paint all of these pieces? You know, executive decision, I'm not going to. I'm going to switch now. So this will, will still remain liquid, especially if I put a drop more water in it. For a little while. Uh, the other thing, I'm not using it tonight, but if I'm doing a lot of, of detail painting in a model, the other thing I use is a wet palette and if you've never used a wet palette it's uh they're easy to make them sell yourself uh you can also buy them red grass gaming do a really nice wet palette that i i use i've used others including homemade ones before um and what that does is basically if you can imagine like a layer of tissue or sponge and then a layer of essentially baking paper right uh, on the top and you uh, and actually you can make one out of the aforementioned takeaway container so if you put like a, a sponge cut a sponge like one of those thin um sort of what, quarter of an inch four millimeter sponges to size at the bottom here and put baking paper over the top of that it has to be not the brown stuff the uh, like slightly translucent um, one you put enough water in to saturate that sponge, uh, pour any excess out, put the baking paper on top, smooth it over. It'll try and curl up at the edges, keep pushing out until it just lies flat. And you put your paint on top of that, and it just keeps it hydrated enough to stop drying out. It keeps your paint soluble for, I mean, if you put the top on, it will keep it on, you know, overnight and stuff. More than overnight, it, you know, you risk things going mouldy. Um, and eventually it will dry out, but it extends the length of, of time. So especially if you're doing, say, bespoke pieces. So if you've got a, you know, you've mixed a colour up, which is just right for what you want, um, but you know you've got to use it later. It's ideal for that sort of stuff because you can keep your paint wet, soluble, um, do those other pieces, and then come back to that. So 
A wet palette is a really good investment if you're doing a lot of hand painting, uh, especially, you know, complex painting. So mini painters use them a lot because, of course, if you're painting a 28 millimeter, you know, say fantasy figure, you're going to be going back and doing this, especially with blending, you know. Um, blending's a whole other topic. Um, but that also is a great skill to develop. Uh, in terms of the cockpit, again, I mentioned about scale effect earlier uh, and darkness, etc. Um, so color theory, I think, is also a really valuable um, it's not a technique, it's kind of uh, just an experience. It's something you've got to, if you're an artist, right? But I think a lot of artists intuitively get color theory. You know, it's why they become artists, the way that, you know, Vermeer saw light or Da Vinci or whatever. But it is something you can also, it, it's something you can learn. Um, the way that light hits something, um, think of a tree, right? Most people think trees, they're brown. Go out and actually look at the bark of a tree, and it won't be the brown that you would have painted it, you know, just thinking of it yourself. So there's an awful lot to, like, looking at things and just seeing how they actually look and trying to represent that. And that's, I think, where you start to to get real skills. Yeah, It takes a lot because you've got to unlearn a lot of things. Like as a kid, you know, you would just do a brown stick with branches, and that's a tree. And it's recognisable as that, but it doesn't look actually like a tree. <laughs> um, and the point I'm getting to is I'm going to be painting this cockpit black, if I can find it. Where do I put the cockpit again? God, it's like the magical disappearing cockpit. Oh, of course, because <laughs> uh, I put it on here to uh, keep it safe. Um, I'm not going to paint this black. And if I'm painting black, I never actually paint black. Um, things like this, like rubber black, or actually what I'll probably do is this dark grey. Uh, because your eyes, if you look at something which is painted black from a distance, and you painted, to so use the same paint, so a piece of paint of paint a piece of plastic black, you know, one-to-one, -one, A4 size or left size, or whatever, uh, and put it out, and then you paint uh, a miniature version of that black, and then look at them both at the scale distance, and the miniature one will look darker. Uh, and the reason for that, even though they're painted in the same paint, is because on one, you have the square footage or square meterage, depending on your uh, measuring system, of light that is being reflected. Whereas on the scale piece, you've got a, a tiny percentage of that being reflected. Uh, and that's why, that's what the scale effect is, right? So the smaller something is, the less light it actually reflects. So the darker colors will look proportionally to the real thing. That's why you have paints which are lightened for particular scales. You know, that's why, uh, People like AK and Vallejo and stuff have done specific lines for one seventy second scale or for one forty eight scale, whatever. Um, it's the same with black, right? Black is uh, a really easy color to represent in one sense, and also a really difficult color to get right. Because if you look at a Hawker Hunter cockpit, it doesn't look like a black hole. Right? It actually looks it looks a mess, actually. Uh, but if you look at the dials compared to the actual, you know, surrounding instrument panel, which is painted black. The dials are a darker black than the black surrounding them, right? Um, because they're behind glass, because they, you know, don't get the wear and the weathering and, you know, all that kind of thing. So I usually start off with a dark grey. And again, I'll just go back on myself a little bit. When we're painting something like this cockpit, I'm going to take it off this, actually. When we're painting something like this cockpit, it's a small piece, right? I'm not trying to paint it the exact colors that it was painted one-to-one uh, -one because of the scale effect. What I'm trying to do is represent how it looks from the scale distance, right? So I want my colors to be lighter. I want my contrasts to be darker because, again, you've got less scale and the smaller scale you have 
the more you need to overemphasize the contrast because again you're not getting the same effect from light itself so you have to create the illusion depth the illusion of the light so and this all sounds very complicated and stuff but basically how i do it is i'll use a like a dark gray as my base black and if you think about it i've done the, the dark gray then i'll go over if i'm airbrushing I'll actually add light gray to that, not white, but light gray. And I'll spray again um, to create artificial shadows. So I'll spray lighter and lighter in the like open areas and the panels and stuff. So what you get is the dark gray fading or the light gray fading to dark in the shadow areas. So you're artificially creating that impression of shadow. That's the first step. And usually three colors works, right? You're, you'll find that in most things, if you've got three color tones, you create that kind of that kind of illusion. You can then go in uh, and I'll dry brush with like a light gray. Humbrol 64 is the perfect color to dry brush with. And actually, if you've got Humbrol 64 in starter set paints, because they tend to dry out, it's perfect dry brushing paint. <laughs> so it's the one thing that I would recommend Humbrol starter kit uh, paints for is dry brushing it's great Humbrol 64 is a i don't know it's just got the perfect balance of light gray it's just a great color um and what you'll see is once you've done that you'll get a very like overemphasized lightness and then i'll go in with tamiya panel line accent i'll actually go in black not the dark brown well actually i mean i, I sometimes use this. The reason this is quite full is because I tend to mix my own. Uh, I think I've got one here. Yeah, here's a grey that I've, I've mixed. So this is oil paint and odorless thinner. Um, so I tend to mix my own washes rather than use these, but they're handy at a push. Right. Here's my black. Um, the stainings from where I spill it, as you notice, I do tend to knock over Tamiya paints quite a lot. Uh, square bottles at least so then you can come in with the black and you know again do an overall wash use your cotton bud or um little makeup applicator to remove from the surfaces and again that's going to pull in all those ways that wash does and then you've created this really rich range of, of shades and that creates the illusion of looking like a black cockpit which you know has all the wear and tear, and of course you can do chipping and stuff on top of that. Um, but just creates the way that light is is falling in there, and it gives that false impression of, of depth and detail and all those kinds of things. That's why I don't use black. <laughs> um, so these ICM colors. So ICM, really interesting company. Um, as you'll have seen from my videos. Um, uh, ICM have, have been kind enough to send me a number of, of kits and paints and things, the figures uh, to review. Um, I think ICM have come on leaps and bounds. Um, again, much like Airfix, you know, I don't think they've had the same journey, but if you go back to the 90s, and I think John Alex experienced this, some of their kits were a bit soft, had some fit issues. I think they're a typical 90s small manufacturer, right? Working through that, that whole path. Um, I mean, certainly not like a model, you know, companies like that, which, you know, you look at their stuff and some of it's rough, really rough. It was never that bad. Um, but more like the early Zvezda, you know, obviously a company finding its feet, getting stuff um, together. Now they are producing just superb kits. Um, the Blenheim that they sent me is just stunning, you know, on par with the Anson, you know, that Airfix did. Um, their paints, I didn't expect anything from at all. I thought, you know, they're a, a small company. They're not focused on making paints. You know, I'll, I'll try them out. They're actually really good for brush painting. Um, I haven't tried them extensively airbrushing. And obviously I'm not going to be tonight because the compressor is foobard. Um, but for brush painting, I think they're thin enough, as you'll see here. I, I use these generally without thinning with water because they 
just seem to be the right consistency for brush painting straight out of the the bottle you see this they're, they're quite thin they don't gum up so if you're not getting that you know big build up that you'll get if you try to do a vallejo or certainly a humbrel um, straight out of the pot see uh, they also seem to dry super quick uh, much quicker i think than, than other manufacturers so again i don't know what it is about their formulation uh, but i really like them so i really wasn't expecting that you know they would really do anything or be anything i thought i'd just be polite about them you know the only thing uh, I think they need to work on is, I won't say the colour matching, but their choice of, you know, what they recommend in terms of colours, because it's um, interesting. But then, you know, I think any of those sorts of things, it's incumbent on the modeler to do their due do, do, to do their due diligence on um, you know what colors they're using and as i've said before i don't think there is a definitive you know oh this is the right color for this you can kind of tell when a color is right you know from your reference sources and uh, the way it looks you know comparing it with contemporary photographs etc cetera, etc cetera. You see that? These are the only paints I've found that you can paint straight out of the the bottle, not diluting, and they'll pretty much do a one coat cover. Now, I think you can thin them a bit, but again, I've not um, I've not washed this, I've not primed it, I've not done anything with it. There's no adhesion issues or anything here, so. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. And some of the colours are really nice. Um, others, not so much. The silver is terrible. Um, so it's not just because they sent me the stuff, you know, to try out that I'm saying nice things about it. Um, I've been offered, recently I was offered a, a paid review on uh, a set of products. Uh, and they were asking, uh, how much do you charge to do a... You know two videos on, on this you know um one is like a, an eight minute video one is an eight minute video with like a, a month of you know coming back and usage sort of stuff uh, and i basically said to them i won't i, I don't charge anything um for review if you want to me to do a review video send me the product obviously you know the product is then mine um because then i can use that for i always use any products that are given to me in, in future giveaways because i think it's a great way of giving back to you guys um and more on that later, because I've got quite a few uh, stacking up. I need to kind of get, pull my finger out and do some more of those. Um, but I said, I don't charge, you know, I'll do the review, but the condition is you'll get my honest opinion. If I think the product is garbage, I'll say, I think the product is garbage. You know, um, I don't want to be paid to say something. That's not who I am. Um, if I say something, it's because I believe it. You know, because I think that's good for integrity. I want you guys to know that if I recommend something, that you can get it and you will find it the same way I have. So one of the things is um, I got this. You know, several people have asked about this and I've told them about it. And a couple of people have bought it. Uh, one of them said, you know, I bought it. It's terrible. You recommend this product. It's garbage. Well, my experience with it, you know, I've given my honest experience with it that the first one I had didn't work, but I bought it through Amazon specifically so I can send it back if it doesn't and I've not lost anything, which is how I recommend people buy it because there's no risk then, right? Um, and now I've got one that actually charges because the first one just didn't charge so I can use it. Um, it's been great. You know, it's been really useful. Um, I don't think it's the best product in the world. I have backed a Kickstarter for a basically a competitor to this, uh, which I'm interested in. In reviewing when it comes and you know seeing if it makes this redundant but this is just a really handy size of stuff they're going to be bad ones that go out 
you know, as with anything, the QC may not be the best, but it's a good product. I've given you that honest feedback. I can't recommend it that everyone is going to be perfect, but that's my experience. You take it or leave it. You know, you, you make your decision on it. I don't want to be paid, you know, however much to say, this is fantastic. They're all great. You know, it, it never goes wrong because that's just not true. Um, and then you lose that integrity. You guys think, yeah, but he's just saying that because they paid him. And I never want that to be the case. So I said, I won't take any money, but that's the conditions. And they were like, oh, well, you know, if we reserve the right, if it's too negative, we won't publish it. And I'm just like, well, look, you know, those are my conditions. Take them or leave them. You know, I'm not really bothered. I've got plenty of videos to do. Uh, if, you, if you want me to do a video on it, I will. But I'm not bending over backwards to meet your terms and conditions. If you want to send me a product for me to review, honestly, I will do that. I'm prepared to put the time in to do that. I won't charge you anything. But what you see is what you get. If you don't want to publish it, that's fine. I reserve the right to put a video on my YouTube channel and say, look, this this thing, don't buy it. You know, you take that risk. If you believe in your product, believe in your product and send it. You know, I, I think that is that is my personal uh uh, approach to these things so if ever i put that i've got a paid promotion um it's always that i mean i have received free product and I always make that very clear you know like with the icm stuff they sent me these products to review they didn't give me any money for it and i reserve the right to say you know what i like about it um and at least you guys know that what i say is you know what i honestly think rather because someone's given me you know this full of dollars so i think you can see that has already dried uh there's a tiny bit in this corner that hasn't but that's basically dry just in the time i've been gabbing on which is you know pretty impressive and you can see it's this nice dark gray but it's not black you can see the shadow is just from this light which is a little bit artificial obviously but you can actually see shadows. You can see differentiation, which is what you want, right? If it all just looks black, that's when things look flat. And if it looks flat, it'll look unrealistic. Not that this is how you have to do things, guys. You know, you do things how you want to do them. And uh, this is just my personal process on why I do what I'm doing. That's kind of why I'm doing these, these streams and these builds. This is how I do stuff. I'm not saying this is the best way. I, I Well, I know it's not the best way because there are people out there who do much better models than me. You know, I am learning to this day, but these are the kinds of things that I've learned from other people. I learned all of this technique from uh, a guy called Phil Stachinkas, who is a fabulous modeler. He now works for Forge World. He does a lot of their painting. He's written, he's written books on masterclasses of he does a lot of 135th scale armor we used to before. And he's done a lot of classes on that. You can go and look him up. Um, in fact, let me put his name in the chat. Uh, he is an absolute legend, and he's a super nice guy. I think that's how you spell it. I guess, yeah. Um, uh, and Phil taught me a lot of a lot of uh, the stuff that I use today. Uh, unfortunately, I don't live, he's from the Northwest, and I don't live in the Northwest anymore, so I've uh, not been able to leech his brain for more stuff, but he's a, he's a real World War II um, German armor nut. So if you lack, um, you know, inspiration for uh german armor um go and look him up and look at a base it's difficult to find his models online because he isn't i think like a lot of very talented people he is not a boastful person he's super nice he's really humble um he, he'll help anybody he'll encourage you know young people into the hobby really good guy um should give him a ring actually I've not spoken to him for a bit. And, no, no, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, if you're happy with your model, that's who it's for, right? This is a very personal hobby. Um, I I have entered competitions in the past, 
Um, I didn't particularly enjoy the experience. Um, and I haven't really repeated it because I don't really feel the need because afterwards I just thought, well, I don't really care <laughs> what, the, what the result was, you know, win or lose. It's just like, so, you know, am I going to do that again? No, not really. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, uh, I don't go for competitive. It was too much. I don't go for competitive modeling. Um, you know, it, it's, I think it's interesting to do, you know, once in a while, because who knows, it might be your bag. You might get, you know, a real itch for it. I know some people who live for competitions, you know, really want to, and also find it helps their modeling, right? So they'll find that um, prepping for a competition, like going, you know, thinking about the IPMS Telford show, you know, they'll be prepping for that from the last Telford show. <laughs> Um, and that inspires them because they've got a target date. You know, they've got, uh, it's a bit like why I did YouTube, right? I started doing YouTube to be able to finish stuff, right? Because I was a terrible procrastinator about starting stuff, you know, and not finishing it. And YouTube has really helped focus me because uh, I want to make, I don't want to disappoint people. I don't want to have them waiting for, you know, a part two of something um, that I've promised, you know, which, uh, takes six months to come out so i mentioned previously in the last stream that this has some seam issues this seat i should have uh wiped that off a bit first um which I think you can see here at this, this front, there is a, a pretty prominent seam. Can you see that? I probably shouldn't have painted it dark gray before trying to show you. Uh, but at the front of the seat, there is a pretty prominent seam. However, that is going to be entirely, you will, you will not see that at all when it's in the, the seat. So I'm not going to do anything about that. This one at the top, not sure. I need to check reference photos to see if, well, one, how visible it's going to be, and B, if that actually is a feature of this uh, mark of ejection seat. <laughs> because although this is out of the box, you know, filling seams, I think, is within the remit of a standard build. You know, not adding extras, but you can, you know, repair obvious issues. But again, I think this ejection, ejection seat is pretty good. For an out-of-the-box item, I'd be more than happy to uh, to paint that and leave it in. Okay. So I am going to go ahead and just give this a light second coat because even though this has really good coverage, there will always still be areas that received more paint or less paint. So it makes it kind of look a bit inconsistent, which an inconsistency in itself, right, isn't bad. But as modelers, we want to control the inconsistency. Um, you know, it has to appear let's see logical again our eyes are very good at spotting things that look natural in the environment um and all of this right okay so I, i'm a biologist by by training right uh, originally all of this comes from evolution right apologies to any creationists out there um but you can trace this actually through various species um the way you survive in a complex environment when things are trying to hunt you and eat you is by filtering out what is normally there and noticing the things that are different so this is why camouflage is a thing in the animal world because camouflage does the opposite it tries to obfuscate your um 
unusual outline and make it part of the environment to allow you to creep up on things and kill them and then eat them. And uh, creatures like gazelles and deers, and monkeys, and ultimately us, are really good at spotting small inconsistencies out of background. We're good at picking that up. Um, and because evolutionary, it was a survival trait, right? Those that weren't good at it, their genes did not continue on <laughs> to create the next generation. They were lost. The unperceptive types uh, were removed from the gene pool naturally uh, by big things with sharp, pointy teeth. So, of course, that's why as modelers, we always notice the inconsistencies and the errors. Blame biology. <laughs> Just take a quick look at the chat. Ah, here we have hello Penny, hello Ed, hello AFC. Welcome. You probably joined just as I was wittering on about biology and big cats and things and thought, what the hell is Alex going on? He spilt some more Tammy extra thin and is losing the plot. Well, I might be losing the plot, but unfortunately I can't blame it on excess solvent usage today. Because these are all acrylic paints, obviously. Um, I was also hoping... Uh, what? I was also hoping that my airbrush was going to be working because I have things I'm going to use I have my first test bits of outlaw paint so I was planning on using outlaw paint to show you some stuff here tonight unfortunately they're airbrush only of course and without an airbrush that's a little difficult unless I get a straw and start blowing through it So, yeah, ICM paints, I would actually recommend giving a go. They're actually, and they're pretty cheap, right? They're only 14 mils, I think this pot is. 12 mils, 12 mils. So, which is still more, actually, than you get in, you know, your standard um, Tamiya Mini Pot, which, you know, I would have, just from visuals, you would have thought that contained more. But, of course, there's a lot of space in there. Um... They usually come, well, they often come in packs of six, like themed around a subject like RAF bombers or, you know, uh, hazard equipment and stuff. Got several different ones here. Um, like the Ghost of Kiev comes with all of the greys and uh, some acrylic varnish and stuff. Um, but they aren't very much. They work out actually some of the cheapest paints you can buy. And the quality of them, I would say, is pretty good. I, I think. But if you if you're hairy sticking, uh, I, I think there's some of the best acrylic paints I I've used for brush painting. Um, now I mentioned before, I wouldn't recommend them for everything because they I think their weakness is their their color range. For instance, right, this is part of their RAF bomber range, and what they recommend for well, the brown is this, which is their chocolate, which I think most of you will instantly recognize is way too dark for RAF brown. You know, regardless of what I've just you know gone on about with learning color theory and all those kinds of things. Now you can per perfectly well mix this, you know, to get an acceptable color um, or range of colors, you know, because you want to do several different shades. But if you were a beginner modeler and you're just going straight off this, you're going to get a very strange looking aircraft because the green they recommend as well is also pretty weird. So again, I think their paint recommendations in terms of like, oh, you use this color to do this. It's a bit like Humbrol, right? If you just go off the Humbrol colors, you can end up with some weird looking aircraft. A good example on that actually is uh, the Typhoon Mark I gift set from Airfix. If you look on the website of their build of that using the paint in the in the set, 
it looks more like uh, like a, an Argentinian post-war color scheme. You know, the green is weird. The gray isn't like the proper ocean gray. It's just strange. Um, so yeah, it's. <laughs> I think, um, and again, I'm not criticizing model companies uh, overly for this, but model companies aren't the same as paint companies. Like companies like Vallejo. Their main business is paint, right? And, you know, associated bits. So they're experts at it. So they're bound to have an edge on Humbrol, for instance, who, although we've been doing it for a long time, there's been a lot of changes, you know, and the market's changed. They're enamels. You know, you can't use Miko anymore. Uh, I think it's methyl, ether, ketone, oxalate or something. Um, so, yeah. Um is their main business? Are they making most of their profit on the paint? No, they're not. So it's always going to be secondary to you know everything else. You know, you, you pay your money, you take your choice. I think the great thing about modeling at the moment, uh, and Moss and I talked about this in Beyond the Box. If you've not, not listened to Beyond the Box yet, what are you doing? Get on your podcast service and dial it up. <laughs> we talked about it in, you know, are we living in a golden age of modeling? And I think absolutely we are. You know, never before have we had the choice. I'm just looking at my paint range here. Let me get, let me show you guys. These are my acrylic paints. Of course, I've got that. Yeah, this is another thing that um, company sent me to to do. That'll be featured soon. Uh, so let me take this actually. This is this is part of my acrylic paint range, right? Okay, part of it. I say so. These are just um matte and gloss colors uh, i've also got a whole bunch more across here um and this doesn't include any metallics it doesn't include washes it doesn't include uh, contrast type paints uh it's probably at least double this but just looking at this if you look you know i've got vallejo i've got uh, citadel citadel i've got pro acryl um that's tamia uh, they're, they're like this because I need to re reorganize them because I've redone my um, organization of these. Uh, that's Model Master, uh, Hataka, uh, ICM. There's just, you know, just an enormous wealth of choice uh, that we have now, you know. Um, I've also got um, Liquitex inks as well um which i've mixed into like a contrast type paint i use some of those on the uh, seeking build um there are no you know nobody can tell you that one particular paint is the only paint you know it's the best it's whatever again there's a huge debate uh, amongst these sorts of people about you know enamel versus lacquer versus acrylic versus alcohol-based acrylic versus whatever you know um Guys, why why argue about it? I use them all. You know, it depends on what effect I want. It depends what's to hand. It depends on how I'm feeling, whether I want to airbrush, whether I want to paint it, whether, you know, I will freely mix different makes of paint together. Um, I tend not to mix Tamiya with anything else. I tend to mix Tamiya with Tamiya because they do require a high percentage of alcohol in them, and a lot of other paints will crash out at that. But that's about the only restriction, you know, that and obviously different. Um, base things like lacquer paints. Um, hi, David. Um, just going back and looking at the chat because I've seen some some coming up. Uh, that's a very good point, Benny. Um, I think the biggest problem we modelers have is if someone looks at your work and says it's good, we have a natural urge to point out their <laughs> Um Well, I agree and disagree. I think I would, if you're using we modelers as this group here and the kind of, I would say, like-minded modelers, I think that's absolutely true. We tend to be self-deprecating. Um, there are a group of modelers who are the opposite way inclined. <laughs> You say it looks good, and they will talk about what a great modeler they are, and it's like that is then quite difficult to get away, you know. <laughs> uh, 
it's, I think it's a small percentage, but I think you're absolutely right. We do tend to uh, <laughs> point out things because we've seen it, right? We've been through the whole process. Somebody coming along just looking at it has, even if they're really interested, they're going to spend, what, maximum five, ten minutes with you looking at your work. Uh, we spent hours with it, you know, and we've been through all that pain. Uh, I think sometimes we want to to share that. Um, Outlaw is definitely going to increase their range uh, as well. Um, sorry, I don't mean to just put Penny's comments up here. I will, because it's just those caught my eye. Um, so I am going to be stocking Outlaw paints. So in the UK, there's only going to be a few a few model shops and outlets where you can get Outlaw paints to start with. We have a limited exclusivity for, for a period. Uh, I'm going to be one of them. Um, it's one of the benefits of being an early adopter. Um, I'm just getting the military range to start with because the, there is a huge amount uh, of outlaw paint. Um, they only come in this size or bigger. And if you can tell, there's a lot of paint in there, you know? Um, so what are these? 30 mils uh, of paint, um, you know, ready to spray. Some people will say, oh, well, you can thin, you know, X, Y, Z paint and uh, get more out. It's like, yeah, but you'll have to do more coats as well. So the coverage of outlaw paint, the paint density in it is very high. So, but obviously they're quite a lot. They're quite expensive compared to, you know, uh, an ICM acrylic, for instance. Completely different in the way they're applied and the rationale and everything. There's no way you could ever put that in an airbrush and spray it and not gum it up um, straight off the bat. You know, you're going to have to thin it. You're going to have to experiment with that. You're going to have to talk about pressures and stuff. This, you just stick it in the spray. Um, so I think for beginner airbrushes, I think this is this is great. Not just for beginners, but I think, you know, it's a great thing to just be able to have a ready-to-go product if you're new to something. And then you're developing the skills rather than worrying about, you know, your paint dilutions. Um, and it doesn't matter what recommendations you have, you will still have to do some fiddling about. Um, but they have a car range, they have, you know, um, pearlescence and metallics and God knows what, um, which is a substantial monetary investment, which I can't afford at the moment. Um, so I'm going to be doing military and expanding that out. But they will be increasing the range themselves as well and expanding and adding to colours as obviously they grow and they get more requests and develop that. Uh, and yeah, as uh, as Nunu said, he's doing his test testing with Outlaw at the moment. Um, I was hoping to start my testing tonight and then expand that on into the week. Um, that Bristol Blenheim I mentioned from ICM, because of these rather odd paint choices, I was going to use the ICM paints for it, um, I was waiting for them, and then when they came, I'm like, mm, uh, maybe not. Um, so I thought, well, why don't I use the ICM paints? Um, I've got the colours for that. I've got the RF colours. Uh, I hope I've got enough to cover a blending. Um, but I think that will be a good test of it. Oh, an excellent question. Uh, the shop is based in Wincanton. Um, the address actually is on the first uh, live video notes. Um, it's also on the, it is on the website. It's a little bit difficult to find actually, but if you type man's model moment shop into Google, uh, I am the first result. I am registered on Google as a business. Now it takes a little bit for it to come through. Um, and if you do buy anything from the online shop, please do leave me a, a Google review. Uh, I think it really helps when you get to five Google reviews. That's kind of a threshold at which, um, you know, it starts to take notice. Uh, oh, that's a good good question. What size bottles are the Outlaw paints? Unfortunately, completely different to <laughs> anything I have, I think. Um, let's just try them against the Tamiya. They're a little bit thinner than Tamiya bottle. Uh, if you want an exact measurement, you have, as I'm sure everybody has just sitting on their bench, a digital vernier caliper.
Okay, let's just make sure that was zeroed. Pretty much. Let's try it without the label. That looks like uh, 33 millimeters, 32.8. So with the label, 33, 33 millimeters. Which is, let's just see, what's that an imperial? One point three two three inches. It's not a particularly um, handy measurement, isn't it? Thirty three millimeters is a much easier measure. And I'm sorry, America, but you, you kind of need to get with the international system, system international, um, rather than bizarrely sticking to the imperial measurements that we imposed upon you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think they are similar. Uh, to MRP and um, is it SMS? Oh, there we go. Tins of old Airfix. My dad, I remember one of my earliest memories is of getting the, we used to have like one of those old tin, like Quality Street, or I think it was Quality Street tins, one of the square metal tins that used to get confectionery in back in the day. Um, and of course, that was where dad used to keep all his enamel paints in this little cupboard under the kitchen sink. And uh, yeah, in there were those old Airfix tins, which were quite thin and narrow, weren't they? They were quite tall. 50 years old. Wow. Uh, are you wrong? Absolutely not. Um, so enamel paints, acrylic paints, lacquer paints, there is no one right paint right the reason that acrylics got such a um boost i would say that really came into play i used to use enamels exclusively right uh the reason enamels came in is because they're water-based so you're not spraying organic solvents um if you are brush painting then obviously it, it's not so much but you still got the evaporating organic solvents which aren't great right you need well ventilated spaces organic solvents are not good for you um and by organic solvents i think mean things like white spirits okay uh, something that doesn't mix with water uh because and the reason they're not good for you and this bit of biology again i apologize i'm going back into science but in your lungs um your alveoli how you breathe the little air sacs inside your lungs a little, you know, air, air pockets um, made of cells like anything else. Organic solvents um, do something called delipidation. So when you spill an organic solvent like alcohol or um, white spirit on your skin uh, and it dries out, you'll notice your skin feels dry, it, it sort of tightens. That's because the solvent is dissolving the fats in your skin and then evaporating. So it dries out and ages your cells, uh, which, you know, aging basically means killing them, um, which is why if you keep doing it, your skin will harden um, as a defense mechanism, you know, build up these layers. Now, imagine that happening in your lungs. That isn't a good thing, right? Um, man's biology moments. Nobody would tune in. Um, but, yeah, if you're using organic solvents regularly, you know, in a confined space, you really need a chemical breathing mask. Um, you know, you only get one set of lungs. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, my dad used to use asbestos and, and stuff, and he died of um, lung cancer. You know, <laughs> that's uh, what happens. You know, um, people say, oh, well, you know, it was fine back in the day. It's like, yeah, but mortality rates for that kind of thing. Uh, were massively higher then so take care of yourself guys you know uh, again do as i say not as i do because you will see me you know, spraying stuff without putting a mask on um i am in a garage right next to a door when i do that i have the door open i have good airflow so i know it's not 100 percent, but it certainly helps and um there we go uh <laughs> Absolutely. I <laughs> should do a test. Make sure you're all listening.
Hi, Tuggers. Good to see you again. Airport hotel. Ah, well, you had very good internet connection last time in your hotel, so. Yeah. So, bench bait and respirator. So, if you've got a respirator, um, that'll take, you know, chemical. It needs to be a chemical mask, right? So, one of those are Lens 65 masks that we all had for COVID won't cut it. That's a particulate mask. That's good for acrylics. And again, this was a huge segue because the original question was about enamels. Um, so acrylics are good because they don't have that organic component, right? They still have particulates, though. So you are atomizing. When you're spraying something, you're atomizing stuff into little tiny bits that hit, you know, and then just uh, sort of spread out and then dry. So that's fine. But again, if you breathe those in, they will dry in your lungs and you've got little bits in your lungs, which isn't good. You know, particles in your lungs equals bad. Um, if you're spraying organics, organics will go through that like it doesn't exist. So, yeah, you kind of uh, you need a chemical mask, which has, you know, these, these filters, which have like activated charcoal and other bits, which basically absorb that, which is why you need to replace them. Um, and then you do sound a bit like Darth Vader, but, you know. <laughs> uh, a bench vent um, will pull that stuff away and reduce the amount in the air. It doesn't get rid of it. Right? What are you doing, little doggy? What <laughs> do you hear that? Sounds like there's some alien creature in the back here with me. Hey, eh? yes, I'll get you'll get your dinner soon. Soon. Okay. So yeah, I've never actually used a a ventilation system. Uh, again, only you know the outside, um, the the big, <laughs> the big one. Um, but I know some people will swear by them, and of course they do help. Um, but I would always go with a respirator rather than um, relying on a bench vent. Um, do I use a spray booth? I do have a spray booth. I have used it very little. Um, the trick is not to spray everywhere. <laughs> so you'll see, and I think it was... Was it Model Minutes that, or LPJ? I think it was LPJ Models that did a, a, a video on this. It's well worth watching about spraying. So where's my airbrush? What have I done with it? No, it's not working, but I can use it as a prop if I can find where I put it. Here we go. So what you don't want to do, so say I'm going to be spraying uh, this. You don't want to be spraying it from this distance, right? which is like a hand's distance. Um, if you're going to be spraying it overall, you probably want to be about this far. Yeah. So maybe five centimeters, two inches for doing, you know, overall stuff. If you're doing detail spraying, you really want to be a couple of centimeters away to get that control. Uh, and this is where the combination of how thin your paint is and how low your air pressure is comes in. Um, so a spray booth is basically designed to contain uh, overspray, right? What I'm saying is you shouldn't really be generating that much. Um, I always am spraying down anyway. I have these. You'll see on a lot of my videos that they'll start off with this nice white background. And by the end of where I finish painting, it's completely covered in all kinds of different colors of, of overspray. Um, but it's patches, right? Because I'm spraying mostly down. Now, yeah, I'm sure there are some bits which get up into the air and, and land stuff somewhere. But I've never had a real issue with it. Will it help? Yeah, it'll help. If you've got an extractor in there, it's great. But, you know, again, it's you pay your money and you take your choice. So the best thing is don't put it out there in the first place. Then you don't have to catch as much. Um but if that's how you want to spray, you know, if you want to spray like a spray can 12 inches away, then, yeah, I would definitely use a spray booth. But, uh, but I've got one. I just don't use it much. Okay. Uh, so that was a whole lot of talking, not much modelling. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is going to come back and um, 
Yeah, these are actually 56, I believe. Gunmetal is 53. 56, I think, is aluminium. But this is a good way of demonstrating something else in, in another way I, that I, I will paint things is for stuff like this, which isn't going to be seen that much, I often paint it in a darker shade than it's going to be to start with. And then I'll dry brush it. So in this case, I'll dry brush this in flat aluminium. And it creates that same effect of artificially increasing the depth. Then I'll give it a wash and I'll call that done. And that will provide enough contrast and uh, that illusion of depth for something that is going to be effectively out of sight. You know, and if you just glance at it, you'll you'll see that effect. But um, yeah, painting a darker color underneath, and you'll you'll see I do this on armor a lot. Armor, I generally prime in black, so I'll pr prime the whole model in black rather than gray. Um, and then I'll come in with the base color, like um, say on the JS two I did with green. Uh, do it all over with green, and I'll gradually lighten that green in the airbrush, uh, creating areas of light and shadow on the model. Um, and that's basically creating that illusion of depth and difference. Uh, and then I'll go in with oils and create the you know the tonal variation. Um, but for stuff like this, doing a dark color, dry brushing in a lighter color, doing a wash, you know, and then obviously um, selectively removing that is a pretty fast way of creating, you know, a reasonable level of depth without investing too much time and effort in it. Especially in something like this, which is pretty much never going to be seen. But I don't know whether it will come through on a video or, or not, but, you know, just doing this couple of coats of this um, gun metal, well, oily steel, um, there's no real brush marks on this. And the way you can tell, especially, is there is actually a pin ejector mark here. I don't know if you can see it. Just here, a pin ejector mark just behind these bottles, uh, which you can see quite easily. So obviously, the thicker the paint you use, the more it'll tend to pool in areas like that. And again, the reason you don't want that, of course, is because that lessens the, the effect of things like washes. It blends it together rather than keeping those nice sharp divides to create that illusion of depth. Because all we're doing in all of this is creating. We are illusionists. What are you doing, Pablo? Yes, we are illusionists working with uh, smoke and mirrors, you know, trying to recreate the, the falling and interaction of light on surfaces. That's the way I always try to, to look at it. Um, because looking at it that way is a bit different than I'm just going to paint this green. I think it's a useful exercise for me. You know, other people might be listening to me talking and thinking, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Which is fine, right? You know. What colour did I sign for the chair? Uh, oh, actually, let's go to this comment first, because that's a good one. Sort of glad you're not wrong for being a traditional enamel user. Um, so as I said in the prior video, one of the great things about our hobby is there is almost, well, there is no way to model wrong, right, for you. Um, just because other people might not like it, that's their issue, not yours. Um, I think it is illustrated very nicely. Uh, by you know what color do you cipher chat that is a response i'm guessing to new news model again if you've not seen uh new new plastic alchemists video on his nat build that kind of is exactly the point right because he did a, a really interesting uh effectively wasn't it new like a a build by committee <laughs> asking the chat you know what colors things should be done in and uh, came out with a blinged out gnat 
which you know i'm pretty sure one doesn't exist in the world it would be great if it did but it's fun right and it's different and i think what you've done is is great and it's part of what inspired me to do this build series although this is nowhere near as interesting in that respect so there is no wrong way in modeling yeah if you're entering a competition if you want to go into competition you know then you have to play by the rules right if you're not doing competition you can do whatever the hell you like and nobody can tell you it's wrong i mean they can tell you but they're wrong you know do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy what you're doing? If you're doing it to please somebody else, if you're doing it as a commission or for competition, then you're putting yourself deliberately in a place where that is the case, right? Everything else, there isn't a wrong. Uh, and whatever materials you use, in fact, I, I started a video um, almost a year ago now which I will get back to, but it was more of a mini painting one. I actually think I'll adapt it because I've got some starter kits. Basically, I started painting some minis using the cheapest acrylics I could find, hobby acrylics. I, I think they were sold in Aldi or Lidl. Um, and just seeing what effect... Now, most people would say you can't use those. Yeah. Um, you can. I mean, they have terrible pigment density. They are not great paints to use. But if that's what you have access to, if that's what you can afford, you can still get results with them. So again, you know, I don't believe there are absolutes in modeling other than the one, you know, the great mantra of if you're enjoying it, it's it's right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you've you've hit there. Exactly. I think live streams are about interaction and uh, it's about everybody's mutual enjoyment, right? And, and learning together if, if that's the purpose of the stream or just having some fun. And yeah, Tagger's good point. Fuzzy dice. <laughs> that was a great touch. <laughs> so again, those of you who haven't seen that stream, head on over to Plastic Alchemist channel. Um, check out the, the build. How many are there, Nunu, no, no, now? Is it three? I'll give it a moment for you to, to get back on that one. But um, yeah, so pink interior, pinky purple interior, um, cowhide pattern seats, uh, fluffy dice, you know, truly blinged out gnat. Um, I'd love to see one in reality <laughs> done in that, that way. Okay, so just going back to this, you know, to the boring one. Um, <laughs> this is now based in that dark grey, right? And you can tell it's dark grey from this, right? But actually, if you look at a gnat, oh, a gnat, I've got the gnat on the brain now. Lulu, what have you done to me? Uh, if you look at the hunter cockpit, actually, it does fade. The black does fade a bit um, to a more grey kind of colour. And again, we're trying to recreate what the eye sees, not the absolute colour. So what I'm going to do now is go to a grey. I'm actually going to use another ICM, I think. Yeah, let's use this. Um, which isn't super ideal, because for dry brushing, you really want the crappiest, driest paint you can get. Citadel paint used to be great for this. The old Citadel paints with the tops that didn't really seal, so the paint gradually dried out which I'm sure was a deliberate ploy by Games Workshop, by the way, because they are one of the biggest money-grabbing companies ever. Um, uh, actually, I've got some... No, no, we'll stick with the icing. Uh, so, yeah, the, the drier the paint is, the easier it is to, to dry brush with. <laughs> Pretty obviously, right, from the description of the technique. So... The ICM paint being a, a quite a nice wet paint. So the thing is with dry brushing is, right, you're removing, you're wasting paint, basically. That's what dry brushing should be called, paint wasting. So you're getting rid of most of it. I always find the back of your hand or thumb is an ideal way of finding that exact point at which you're happy with. 
this is actually going to be a little bit more than I would typically do, but it will work better on the stream. And then you're just going over to catch the edges. You see there? And highlight those pieces. As I say, I'm going heavy handed here. So it'll show up more on the stream. And also, the thing with dry brushing is you want to start off uh, lighter, lighter handed, if that's a, a phrase than I'm doing here, because you can, it's easy to put on more dry brushing. It's difficult to take it off. And you can see like the, the difference here, right? But you still want to go lighter than you think you need. Because remember, we're going to wash over this, and that will knock it down. So if you've never done dry brushing before, I'd highly recommend getting getting a spares box, finding a piece that has some detail. You want something that's got some raised pieces on it. And just giving it a go, practicing on that, because it, it's a technique like many others. You've got to kind of find your rhythm with Got to find what works for you. And it takes a little while to get where you want to be. So one of the things it's doing here that I'm doing deliberately. So yes, it picks out the edges in detail, but I'm also going on the sides a bit to try and get that, because I'm not airbrushing, to try and get the lightness kind of going in more. And you can use kind of a, there's lots of things you can do with, with dry brushing and stippling. Um, is kind of that kind of here I'm see I'm stabbing that's having a different effect that's kind of stippling down on the bit but what we're doing there is I'm getting more of an effect here and much less in this corner where there'll be natural shadows gathering because what you don't want to do is stick it right down there right because light's not getting there in the same way so with dry brushing, and even if you are an experienced dry brusher, if you're not trying things like stippling or um, you know using a slightly wet brush, all worth trying out. Um, again, I think you are never old, too old or too experienced to try new things. Now I'm doing the same thing with the ejection seat here. So I'm going to take off that because it's, it's easier to do with it in my hand. Um, I always try and brush in the direction that the light would be coming from. So there you see why, because it's getting more on this top bit and less at the bottom. You also notice I haven't detail painted this yet. And that's because I don't want to dry brush what I'm then going to brush over in the details. Right, because this is about creating a, a base effect not my kind of top layers. So don't worry about, you know, over brushing onto stuff that you're going to paint over anyway. You want to be doing the kind of background, the baseline of this, uh, and then you can come back and, you know, do your detail paint and whatever else you want to do on top of it. Um, it's very difficult to go back and correct dry brushing, though. Not very difficult. It's a pain in the ass, basically. Okay. And again, I'm going a little more heavy handed than uh, perhaps I would normally. Because it will show up better on, on the camera and the stream. But also, I do want to go, you know, higher than you might expect to create a higher level of contrast, which is then going to be knocked down by the wash. Because the worst thing, just morally, just from your, um, sorry, not morally, from your morale point of view, um, is to have done a whole bunch of work and then you put the wash on and you just watch it all disappear and not, not survive and you think, well, what was the point in all of that? <laughs> right? So there. So, you know, if you wanted to and, you know, you're not a decal person or don't have decals, a, a base 
and a dry brush you know can get you enough detail that you think well actually that's good enough just to be what's going to be seen in the cockpit you can of course come back with another lighter color so i tend never to use white as a base dry brush unless i'm doing a different technique like xenophil priming which is a completely different topic uh, which i will talk about at another time and if you are doing that i would recommend you get something like this this is uh, liquitex liquitex are a great brand they're artist materials um, artist materials in general tend to be better quality than modeling stuff i'm sorry but it's true um, this this is titanium white uh, liquitex this is a heavy body acrylic so you can open this you'll see it is like a like a paste yeah this is like ideal dry brushing stuff there look see it turtling <laughs> quite disgusting um it is fantastic stuff uh, and this will last i am sure my life and beyond but I will talk about that certainly another time. Uh, just going quickly back. Uh, oh, you, you've got to do a pink bear cat. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, Games Workshop. Um, Games Workshop are an interesting company. Um, again, I could talk at length about Games Workshop, but that I think is for another time. So this, I think, is ready for its decal. I'll do that at the start, I think, of next time. Uh, this is ready for its detail painting. Uh, and after we've done that, it'll all be ready for washing. Uh, actually, just before we finish, let's just go quickly. A very quick dry brush of the interior. You just need to pick out those, those ribs. There's just enough, I think. It was a, a reasonable effect there. This actually isn't an ideal brush for dry brushing. You generally want one with shorter bristles. I actually find there is a brand here. You can buy specialized dry brushing um, brushes, right? They're very expensive. Uh, and in my own opinion, a complete waste of money because you can buy things like this. This is an elf contour brush. This is a makeup brush. This is probably one of the best dry brushing brushes I've ever used. And I can't remember how much they cost. I, I did buy like a whole bunch of them. You could only get them from the States at one point. And uh, a friend in, in Canada, well, from North America, a friend in Canada helped me get them. They're just really good. This one's actually dried out. I need to uh, uh, give it a good clean with brush cleaner. Um, but you see, nice soft brushes. So other makeup brushes work. It's just Elf happened to be a really nice uh, brand, a uh, really good quality. So anything that has short, you know, uh, dense brush bristles like this that you can, you know, just rub over a, a model. Yes, yes, we'll get food. Um, <laughs> my dog reminding me there that we need to eat. Um, it's really good, really good for that. So, again, just an example of you can spend as much or little as you want with modeling. You know, there are always materials um, that we can use, which are actually as good or better than some of the proprietary tools um, that we can buy. Um, but that, the Elf Contour Brush is a really good one for dry brushing. Uh, so this is all at a stage where I think we can do some more bits. Um, I've done a lot of talking tonight and I realize not a lot of modeling. I apologize for the airbrush situation. I'll have a look at my... Um, compressor through the week see if we can get that up and running for next time uh, and we'll get some details done on this we'll get the cockpit finished into the fuselage and i think then we're going to progress pretty quickly through uh, the rest of the build i think by 
by the fourth session we'll be i'll be on to actually you know painting the exterior and all of that good stuff let's see if that prediction comes true <laughs> Uh, just see that. Yes, I do end up buying a lot of Moss's auction. So uh, I'll let you into a secret, uh, guys. Um, and I think it's it's probably something that you haven't really caught on to. But um, one of the reasons that I will bid on stuff at Moss's auction is that um, quite often there aren't a lot of bids. And I think Moss does a really good job. And I think he deserves not to... I, I know we all like bargains but i think also we should support our our friends and uh, fellow youtubers uh, and i want to make sure that he gets decent prices for his kits you know i don't want to see them go for like a fiver and stuff i would rather buy them at a you know a, a higher you know, try and give the auction up a bit and um, i'm happy to buy the kits you know i will always find a place for them either in my own stash or you know in the in the shop so that other people can enjoy them if they're not something that I particularly you know, want. Um, but yeah, I think we should all have that uh, kind of view. You know, the auctions aren't really about us getting the cheapest possible kit we can. It's really about, you know, helping each other out. And I think uh, if you do that, I would like to think that the kind of karma thing comes back to you uh, and other people will help you out at the same time. That's part of what our little YouTube circle is about, really. Um, is about trying to help each other's channels. It's about how how to get the word out to the modelers. You know, get other people into the hobby. Um, that's one of the things that you know I'd like to hope that comes from these live streams is that you know if some people learn some things along the way. Uh, I'll be very happy. You know, I'm just modeling, so I can do this all day with or without the camera. Um, I'm really happy to actually have the, the chat there and to be distracted by it, and you know go on talking about science and other you know esoteric topics along the way um and if you learn about science as well as modeling then i'm even happier but um <laughs> yeah i just think it's in the spirit of uh of being good people you know good friends and um that's kind of uh one of the reasons that uh i, I want to support moss's auctions and uh, i hope you know you guys do too i know that he's had several people not pay him the goods that they've won you know so that he spent a lot of time and effort you know researching postage and stuff and then they haven't come to fruition i understand people's circumstances change but um i think if you've committed something like an ebay you know there's a legal contract there um he's just doing it you know off his own back so i would say if you guys can support him in that kind of thing i just think that's a good thing to do i'll get off my soapbox now i don't mean to to lecture anybody that's not the intent um but that's all I'm going to be doing for this evening. I think two hours is is long enough. My doggo, as you can hear, is uh, asking for food, so I don't think I can, can put him up anymore. Okay. So I shall say hello to the the good people. This is Pablo, the scale model doggo, who is looking for his his food. So I think. Oh God, there we go. Now, I was saying about, I forget that I've got these things on, right? This is just to show that that's not BS. I can't get the camera right now. There we go. So I've completely forgotten I've got these things on. <laughs> uh, they do leave a bit of a mark, but it's not actually, it doesn't hurt. So, so from Pablo, bye everybody. And uh, I will see you guys next time. Um, I'll put up an invite uh i may do wednesday i know that wasn't necessarily a, a popular day but i think i didn't get a lot done today and i would like to kind of crack on through this so that i can get the comparison one uh, i don't want to spend six months doing two hunters um and i don't think you guys would want me to either so i'll put up an invite not an invite i'm thinking of work now when you go to zoom calls and team meetings um i'll put up the the live stream um for that um in the next day or so but otherwise thanks enormously as always for joining have a great end to your weekend and a great week to come and i'll see you on the next one cheers guys <laughs>